So hello, welcome to the 33rd edition of uh, AHEX TV and uh, with uh, really hot drama, so 10 minutes ago, so uh, what happened? So there, we have uh, in Germany a an, an conference organizer called, uh, called Software and Support and what I did, they uh, confused me with uh, Jürgen Höhler and they published that. And this is basically me, so I don't know from where they have the picture, but uh, it's actually me and some conference, I assume JAX or WJAX. And uh, what this is, it says like in 2017, there will be like revolutionary Spring 5.0 framework, not revolutionary, um, reactive Spring uh, 5.0 uh, framework with reactive streams and um, classic server and uh, embedded runtime and, and um, JDK 1.9. Um, support and the funny story is um, that's me consultant author and you can <laughs> you can register or you can um, yeah uh, register to the conference with that and uh, I've actually I'm not a spring committer so they just confuse me uh, with um, with Jürgen but by the way indeed spring framework 5.0 is going to be interesting because um, they do a lot of reactive stuff they're re rethinking transactions right now so it is going to be interesting but uh, I got a uh, lots of, you know, there is a uh, like Twitter storm happened right now, like Adam Bean is the Spring Evangelist. I am not working for, for Spring Source. Uh, I'm just a consultant and most of my projects, or I would say this year all my projects were actually Java 7 and uh, Java 8 and um, Spring. Sometimes I work with Spring if um, it's a older project, but what we start, what we are starting or what I started was Java 7, but still Spring 5 is interested in, in interesting and uh, it was a uh, interesting, also funny glitch. Okay, so end of year happens. So let's start with the uh, content. So uh, lots is going on in chat and there is, uh, and this uh, Sebastian apologized for the mistake. So uh, don't worry, <laughs> just funny. And uh, I thought uh, someone photoshopped me. This was my first suspicion. Okay, so we have lots of topics. Um, first, Java E8 news. So what happened? So there will be no uh, GMS next, but the GMS 2.0 is going to be part of the Java 8. It's not like uh, there will be a new updated spec. Um, it will be become just a part of that. So what I actually did, I um, sent a mail with a suggestion to, to actually deprecate SOAP. So um, I think SOAP was not updated for years in Java E, and I think this, uh, I, what I mean is uh, JAX WS. And I think um, if you if you listen to the show, you should just write, you know, to the Java E user list and try to drop SOAP. This would be really nice uh, also for argumentation in, uh, in Java E projects, like, you know, don't rely on deprecated technology. What also happened, so uh, Oracle woke up. So there is an early draft of the Java 8 spec so I will just uh, put it to the chat, and um, and uh, it's basically it's just uh, the first the first edits. So it's not like uh, uh, everything is new, and um, and uh, what also happened uh, the uh, management spec was dropped, which is a pity. Um, I was a bit involved in the in the management spec, so I just reviewed the reference implementation from Red Hat last year, and. Um, and the problem I see with that is the following. It's like uh, no developer is interested in management because uh, what we like to do is to implement business logic as fast as possible, or this is actually what, what should happen. And managing server, it is not an interesting job, and this is actually a an, an DevOps job. So I think, you know, asking in a survey whether developers are interested in, uh, in, in management is uh, a little bit off. Is it the same like you no know, car manufacturer will ask you whether you are interested in measuring pressure in the tires or whatever? You know, it's as boring. So no one buy a car because of of management interface of a car. So um, this is a pity, and and why it's pity? Because what we could do then is just to use you know uh, to st standardize a bit on on, on monitoring metrics and and management and 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 for instance in doc environment you can you can automate the setup of application server this is a bit pity but uh yeah but i understand oracle then don't have uh, indefinite resources or they have focus on whatever can be done but this is a pity and what's also interesting interested happened oracle could could um is interested to pass over 
the MVC spec to an organization, which is uh, actually and the first time I heard about this. And this is actually nice because someone else could take over uh, the MVC spec. So model view controller spec, the new spec. So there, there, there will be, you know, the next release of MVC. So this is what happened in the Java E um, in the, um, oh, actually, this is, uh, this is my, <laughs> my email. So um, I, I, I wrote that um, they should rather prune soap than, than uh, J JMS. But, um, okay, so uh, this was, uh, I didn't, actually, I didn't meant prune here, like, you know, there is no JMS next. So this was uh, unfortunate wording here. Okay, so this one, and what also happened, there is a new JSON B in Eclipse link. They are going to be split and there will be going to be a new project, uh, Eclipse project with JSON bindings. On it, what we have was the JSON P, like JSON processing, the JSON parsing, rather than binding JSON object to, um, yeah, JSON object to Java objects. It's like Jax B specifically for JSON. And this is the project, uh, go, uh, the uh, project Yasin. So I will just copy this. So if you like, you know, help me to prune soap. This would be nice. You know, go to Java e and say, we have to prune soap. Okay. Um, yeah, and there's also a quick update. as the official news with uh, management. And as always, uh, we get greetings from Greece. So hello to Greece. I hope it's warm in Greece. Uh, in Germany, we have minus degrees, so Celsius, minus Celsius degrees. I'm really, I'm, I'm, it's really interesting how warm or cold it is in Greece. So we have that. Um, and now start with the, with the first question. So I'll just make it a little bit larger. So when someone asked me, uh, they are interested in commercial distribution and uh, um, what to, to, to choose, Lock or Splunk. And this is really hard for me, you know, to um, to suggest a commercial commercial solution. Um, this Lock uh, IO is uh, is like hosted Elk, and Splunk is uh, I would I would say the origin idea commercial service which is able to consume a large amount of of, of log files and consume that. And um, so, which solution you you think fits the best? And and I have to say, it is really hard to compare because, um, yeah, one is based on the open source ELK and the other one is the Origin Splunk uh, service. And uh, it is really <laughs> what, I think it does not matter what you use from the commercial point of view, because uh, what happens in one of the companies goes out of the, bu out of the business. This is the first, do, do you have some compliance, you know, some compliance requirements where you have to keep, you know, the audited data for years or whatever? What happens then? So there are some, you know, lots of, you know, requirements we, we would have to, to, to walk through. The first thing I will ask, you know, what you are, sub what you would like to store there? Just are the, you know, unstructured logs? What I know that this Splunk is really, uh, very good in in in, in uh, extracting information from unstructured uh, uh, logs, or your uh, logs are probably already structured. So um, what you could do is just to um, to focus on um, on 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 storing, you know, uh, streams or tech uh, uh, event of streams. Uh, yeah, streams of events. So uh, tech events or structured data. Um, so this would be uh, this would be one of my uh, of my of my further questions. And um, what I also don't get is why it has to be a soft as a service. So, um, so what you could do you now, you could just use Elk out of the box in a Docker container. What we do in in our project. So, um, so this is a broader question. And uh, what's also interesting, you know, we have to separate like uh, st streaming or events or logging and and metrics like, you know, you can do it with Prometheus or Nagio, Nagios or st stuff like this. So um, what's also not clear, would you like to buy a software as a service and, 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 and send the logs remotely or rather than, you know, buy the software and run it uh, on premise? This is also uh, also uh, important this, this distinction. Okay, so... Um, 
half half big question but uh elk or splunk so elk is uh, a recognized tag with uh lots of support and splunk is known for years and uh, yeah so you you are already on the right, right path i would say so the next one is like a meta question and someone asked me about um promotion code so actually i don't give any promotion codes for uh for the um this is asking about the online courses so airhex.io airhex.io this is the online version so th these are uh, why not because i try to be as cheap as possible so you can you can rent them for 10 10 dollars or buy it hd for uh 39 dollars and you know m managing the 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 codes would be a terrible exercise for me i, I would spend i don't know uh <laughs> Uh, a lot, uh, uh, lots of time uh, with that, and I think, and also for the for the on-premise courses, I also don't give Reb um, any any discount as well here. This is one of the um, why because uh, I think it's really competitive. So um, and I try to you know to 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 keep the the prices down, and then have no head ages about management and uh, managing the rabbits codes and you know. Um, then I will have probably have to hire a pre-sale department, and this is what I actually try to avoid and still focus on, on technology and hacking. So no, no discount codes. And as as far as I know, it's also not possible to offer bundles from Vimeo. So and um, yeah, and if I would offer, you know, the discounts, it would be unfair to some users. So it's really a mess, I would say. So uh, we covered this. So uh, hey, by the way because we are already in the workshop mode. Um, I had We had to upgrade the room to so the largest room because we get some uh, some registrations. And uh, so right now they uh, we get we got the largest available room on Airport Munich. So uh, if you like to come, come next week. So no, next week, it is start as uh, December 12th. There's enough room for everyone right now. So um, yeah, and of course in March, there will be some JavaScript going on. And the next bunch of workshops, I think, is going to be in April or May. Um, you have no time before. And uh, there will be one new workshop like uh, monitoring, matrix, uh, measurement, uh, debugging, profiling, and troubleshooting. Okay. So now workshops are over. Um, that one is interesting. Um, so um, the question is about uh, application scoped and stateless. So when to use... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when to use application scoped and when to use uh, stateless. So, um, and uh, it seems like there are two layers, resources and service layer, and application scope is REST and the service is stateless. I would actually just put the stateless at the resources and leave the service without any annotation or put it stateless on the service annotation because uh, it looks like, and then he asks, is it correct to use application scope in bin set insert objects into MongoDB? And the answer is it really depends which driver are you using because application scope means all the threads will hit uh, the one driver at the same time. So you will need a kind of um, uh, transaction scoped injection or request scoped injection of the of the MongoDB driver or the driver is already multi-threaded. So I think the safest thing would be if you don't like stateless and you would like to get rid of monitoring, just use request scoped. If you like, um, if you if you have nothing against EJBs. Uh, just use stateless and by the way uh, just remember github samolisov so ejb versus cdi so a nice guy from ibm and he compared ejbs with cdi and um, ejbs and ejbs were as fast as the others um, and and why that because all the, the dependency injection tree was actually cached okay so uh the answer is resources has to have to be a request scoped or at stateless and services has to be stateless and application scope is exception from the rule and usually i use application scope for uh, i don't know configuration caching and stuff like that okay so any questions from the field no questions here no questions here Okay, exception factor is an exception pooling. So uh, I, I tweeted uh, once ago uh, that I spotted in a code review exception interface and exception factor, which was funny. And then I remembered that I actually implemented by myself an exception factory. And um, and uh, the reason was interested. So um, um, 
this was like um, a bank or a huge insurance or something like this. And uh, what we did back then is the following. Uh, I remember there was an back, um, a mainframe system, a host, and the host was available from 9 to 5, and after 5 it did something else. So we couldn't access the host, we would get a different kind of exceptions, like host not available exception, something like this. And uh, what I did then, uh, I created an exception factory, which depending on the, uh, on, the, on the current time, was able to throw different exceptions. And um, I think the uh, when from production was no more time dependent rather than exception depending. So specific exceptions were converted to system exceptions and the other one to application exception. But this is really exception from the rule. And um, what I spotted in the code review was like someone tried to make, you know, exceptions, a uh, decoupled way of throwing exceptions, like there was exception interface and it could uh, make a modular exception. So it could replace the implementation of the exception. Okay, so this is, I implemented an exception factory once, but I, 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 I hope uh, the, uh, the reason um, was, uh, yeah, it was specific reason. Okay, so um, the next one is, uh, this is uh, interesting, it's, um, it's this Java VIX, which runs on Spring Boot. And um, what what the problem is, there is like a model window, and um, there is a long long um, a longer task going on behind the scenes, and it blocks the window. What to do? And um, take a look at Lightfish. This is um, if you go to my GitHub account, GitHub Lightfish, exactly. And the Lightfish comes with a Light View client. And I what uh, what it does? There are several. They were uh, several um, several long running tasks. Um, the, the whole no several long running tasks. The um, the communication with the backend is asynchronous. So look what I did there, and um, I used the um, I think how it's called uh, FX invoke later. And um, so what you have to do is um, in your case I would take a look on completable future completable future in Java 8. So you do uh, the uh, long running task first and then without blocking. And then you passing the results to the view, but indirectly. Indirectly means um, with, um, with uh, wrapped with the um, GFX invoke later. And actually, if you, if you look at the Afterburner framework, it already does it for you. So I would just go to Afterburner, Ho hopefully, no. Okay. And I hope we will find that. Um, let's see. Invoke with annotation. But there is an asynchronous way of. I'm just interested whether I will find that. No. This was the pre presenter factory and views. So take a look at Afterburner or uh, on um, on Lightfish, and you will. Um, I can just take, cannot do this. I see we have some trouble with the internet connection. So and um, this is what I'm actually doing. So I'm instantiating the views um, asynchronously, and then the result is going to be passed to the to the to the Java X update thread. And uh, this is very similar approach to Swing invoke later. And uh, in Java VX, there is uh, uh, the same class called like JFX utilities or something which invokes uh, the, uh, which passes the data to the view uh, using the UI thread. Okay, I hope, uh, so I'm, I'm actually, what I cannot do, I just cannot fix your code. So I have no time for that. But if you look at a light view, this is uh, asynchronous and look at the afterburner, it is uh, uh, already capable of updating the view behind the scenes. Okay, then there was a longer, a longer discussion with um, suffix utilis evil. So, it, oh wow, it was almost uh, 10k views. 
and um, and someone asked me what's so bad about a kitchen sink so actually if you know in my opinion nothing is really bad or wrong in soft development but uh, if you um, whatever we do there, there should be a reason otherwise there will be a cargo cult and um, cargo cult is funny so if I have the opportunity you always cargo cult programming so it is um, I show it already several times during the air hacks. And this is um, the cargo cult program style of computer programming characterized by the ritual inclusion of code or program structures that serve no real purpose. Um, yeah, this is what it is, cargo cult. And uh, the question is if, uh, okay, let's take it seriously here, the cargo cult. Um, what actually means util? And um, what I did, I performed uh, several code reviews um, this year. And usually, uh, you know, uh, packages, util packages, obvious, they are really bad. So if you look at Java util, there's everything in place. So there's, a, you know, usually you get uh, util, foundation, whatever. You get lots of packages with the names, which uh, are meaningless. And um, and then I started to look at classes. And what I did recognize, there are also lots of classes which ends with util. And I thought, okay, um, what this actually means. So um, if, if, if I put a util on the class, on the end of the class, what does it, which information information does it provide? And actually nothing. So I would say it would be a lot better, you know, to skip the util. And then uh, you will get a class which is usable. It, the name of the class would be like, for instance, Java Lang Math. The class Math is a utility class, but there is no math util. So if you will call the class Math Util, there will be no ad additional information. Um, so just saying something is util, it means it degrades the class to something, you know, a throwaway quality, which uh, which comprises a lot of methods which are probably probably not um, co cohesive. So they have nothing to do, to do with each, with each other, and this is the reason why you call something util. And what I also did, then I became curious and I tried to find, you know, uh, classes uh, in JDK. So. And what is surprising? Uh, okay, no, okay, no, is exactly. There are just eight classes with util in the names. So what I what I recognize, and this is remarkable because there are four thousand two hundred two hundred forty classes, and exactly eight have the util in name, which is remarkable. So um, in you know I was in projects with less classes than four thousand, and there are lots of util classes. So um, I would say util is uh, not the best practice. And I try to avoid util altogether. No packages with util and no classes with util. I hope you are with me. So, and um, if you if you name it util, you can do it. But the question is why. So, questions here? No questions. No questions here. Interesting. So, an old interview with um, one of uh, the Airhex attendees and uh, becomes really popular. So, like uh, the breaking parts here with uh, uh, brake parts for cars with Java E. Okay, so uh, we covered this topic. So next one, um, okay, no youth in the future. So, and this one is an uh, easy one. Um, how to configure JDBC data source in the Payara configured doc container? What is Payara configured? So um, first, there is a project called Docklands on GitHub. And just for you, what I did today, you will find a new image if you're interested. Engine X image image with um, Tommy load balancing if you are interested. But um, now he asks. Uh, so what is Docklands? Docklands is a as a set of Docker files I use frequently in my projects. And these Docker files are as simple as possible, and all are based on the super Java uh, uh, Docker file. And the reason for this is um, I try to keep, you know, the Docker images very small, and this this project helps me with that. So I extracted the Docker files from commercial projects, or extracted, rewrote in actually from scratch. And uh, yeah, and he asked me, okay, there is a Payara image, and there is Payara configure, and the idea of Payara configure is, you know, to provide to provide uh, project-specific settings. Like here, for instance, I'm creating uh, some JVM options. So the question is, no, imagine we would have, uh, we would like to have uh, GDBC data source and uh, yeah, how to deal with that. And the answer is, um, it is actually done and not in the configured rather than 
then in the Payara pink. So what I did here, I added the pink war to the image here. And of course I did it into I added it to the deployment there. What you should do, you will have to download, for instance, the Postgres drive and add it to um, Glassfish lib. And then you can just, you know, create the data source. And if the yeah, this is this is the the, the answer. So I will just put it to chat. So this is your answer. Cool. So we have that. So is it be is better to run the database in a Docker container or on the host? It is a lot better to to run it in a Docker container if you can run it, if you have the control. Why? Um, it is uh, really easy to test. So you can just launch, you know, the database. Uh, f uh, you just, you know, take the data and, and run it um, in a test environment, integration environment. So this is really nice. Um, this is perfect. And uh, and also you can use Docker networking. So what you can do then, you can just rely, you know, on expose port, which never will change, and the Docker container name. So you can it's a lot easier to uh, to implement staged environment if in the case a database is running in Docker container as well. Uh, what I recommend, if you can, of course, have uh, have uh, one application per microservice or per application is the best. A shared um, database, uh, it is, um, it will cause. It just there, there is no advantages of ha of having a shared database. So um, yeah, it is harder to scale, harder to maintain, and harder to upgrade. So, so thank you, Nikki. So where do you save Docker images which cannot be public? So this is actually very easy to answer. So I save them in the private Docker registry. So Docker. Minus D, minus um, minus P five thousand, five thousand, and what you can do, you can run now Docker run, um, launch the registry, registry v two. Oh, I can do. I didn't pull it. No, wait a second. I don't think. No, there is a, a fresh Docker installation, so there is no. But the registry v2, uh, if you if you perform this oh, registry two, actually this one. So um, I don't actually. No, it's still not. Too late. But internet is still going. But we are. <laughs> what it will and it pulls the uh, the um, private Docker registry. I would just have to stop that. Other ones, I, there will be problem with the stream. So this one will pull the Docker uh, registry, private Docker registry. You can use it to store your Docker images. And what you should know, I think Nexus 3 and Artifactory, they all have Docker support. And if your company is using something like Red Hat Enterprise Linux, they have so-called satellites, which also store private Docker images. So uh, I have to say, the Docker registry, private Docker registries are as well integrated to enterprise as a Nexus servers. Okay, cool. So, next one. Dry principle, single object for saving into database and the safe object, and the same object, I guess, same object return via REST endpoint. Um, and the problem is some some things, some uh, some fields um, should not uh, be transferred over the wire. And the question is, what to do with that? So you can use JSON ignore with JSON. Of course, you could wait until Java 8, of course, which is not viable. And uh, what I do with that, I have to say more and more what I do in my projects, I use JSONP right now to expose the uh, the objects via REST. So we have no DTOs, just entities. And if we, um, for instance, use Elasticsearch, then we have just uh, Java classes if we have some behavior. Otherwise, we use JSON from, from the beginning to the end. And this is what I would suggest. And uh, of course, you can be dependent on Jackson. So then you will use JSON ignore. But uh, if Java 8 uh, comes out, then you can replace that with uh, with the standard annotation. And the next one, which mechanism uh, mechanism do I use for queues? And surprisingly, this uh, question was asked. I was asked a lot of times the last uh, two weeks, actually, in all projects. I don't know why. It's like everyone asks about queuing. 
And my first question is, okay, uh, why we need queuing at all? So usually the reason is we have like payment system or order system and what we actually need from GMS is deliver once and only once quality. This is why we need queuing. For all other purposes in, in, in my world, so again, I'm not at Facebook, uh, Netflix or Twitter, um, so we are just, you know, lower scale applications. So uh, just using JaxRS for everything is perfectly fine. But um, in uh, we have in one project with, um, oh, the chat is becoming nervous. Um, okay, so we got a follow up question. And, um, and um, in one of my project, we have lots of, we are going to be a massive amount of data and uh, and the data um, could be partially lost, but we, uh, it, it, it is um, like, um, yeah. And in this particular case, uh, we will probably use Kafka in one case. And the other case, we will use uh, Hazelcast. For instance, Hazelcast can be also used as an, as an uh, this is in memory grid or in Finispan, they both can be used as communication medium between the nodes. But uh, I will st stick with JaxRS first, and then if it's not enough, then you know, uh, think about why we need queuing at all. Um, could be, for instance, that uh, some microservices are not available all the time and you will queue, queue the stuff. For instance, something like this, then you will need a persistent queue. So the question is, would you just like you know, to communicate asynchronously? Do you have to use persistent queues? And is this deliver once and only once an issue? And are duplicates allowed, for instance? This is the, the, the main, main things. Okay, so I hope I answer that. And the next question is uh, how to deal with foreign keys. So foreign keys, um, how to deal with foreign keys? You will have to use, uh, um, you will have to access the other microservice and and query it, or not to query it, just invoke the service, the JaxRS. So you get the n plus one problem, of course. So you have to um, you have to do it wisely. So what it actually means in microservice architecture, the, um, or microservices, yeah, or microservice architectures, in, um, can be only successful in case. You are really um, uh, down. Um, you are really uh, experienced with the domain and business logic. So the technology does not matter a lot, but you have to be skilled in the business logic and domain target domain. If you know this, you know you know how to how to create microservices which do not interact a lot with each other and uh, don't share joints, for instance. Okay. Perfect. So we have this and this. What happens here? Okay. Um, okay, queues done. So what's going here? Um, uh, this is okay. The question is, you know, how to um, how to have rolling updates with uh, with Docker, and um, I hope you do. And I'm being... You should look at the video, take a look at the video. Something with HA proxy, load balancing Java e microservices. So I will just put it to the to the chat. So and um, what um, what uh, what I did, I just created um, an HA proxy, started two Java e servers. It was Payara, and then I killed one server and restarted the server. So if you just have the setup going, and if this is HA environment, usually you will get two HA proxies, and for for two microservices and uh, and, and usually hardware load balancer um, in front of them. And then if you just kill a service, the HA proxy will recognize this and reroute all the traffic to the other one. And you can have, of course, you know, four microservices. You are not limited to have to, to have two. So you can have as many as you like. And um, and and what happens then? Well, um, um, you can just, you know, kill the, uh, the, the services, introduce a new one. 
uh, and um, what you can also do, so look at the, go to in, uh, and t take a look at the screencast, you could actually connect and disconnect the microservices in the running system. So you can launch a microservice, kill the old one, and then in the next millisecond, you know, replace it with the new version. So rolling updates are fairly easy. You can automate this. And of course, um, if you have one, um, one server, it, uh, it is viable. But if you get, you know, um, 2,000 servers like uh, Twitter or Netflix, you need uh, infrastructure. Uh, in my project, we, we, we are not Netflix. We have a couple of microservices, so not a big problem with that. And uh, if it's a little bit larger, take a look at OpenShift. And it nicely integrates, for instance, Kubernetes, which is able to, um, to, use, um, to use rolling updates with tagging. So Kubernetes is the next stage. So st stay with uh, plain Docker if this does not work for you. Take a look at Kubernetes and OpenShift, for instance, provides a nicer view to this. Cool. The next one is Project Lombok. And uh, kudos to the project, actually. This is a very old project, and they are still active. And what uh, Project Lombok does, it uh, tries to, you know, make the Java development nicer. So what Lombok does, you have a couple of annotations. You put the annotations on on, um, on fields, and it's able to generate getters and setters. For instance, getters and setters, or to string method, or whatever. And the question is, you know, what is my take on that? And um, as I said at the beginning, most of my projects are Java E projects, and in Java E projects, we we just focus on the business logic. So, for instance, uh, a builder pattern is already not as common in 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 Java E. I did it once in in or or a few times, for instance, in um, Porcupine project. So there is a builder pattern, but usually it is more like if you're building infrastructure, builder pattern is more common because with builder you give the developers opportunity, you know, to use your object a little bit nicer. In, uh, in real world projects, and, and builder pattern is not as common, for instance. Getters and setters are actually not needed in Java E. So if you have, um, you can uh, use uh, injection to private fields, JPA can just uh, deal with private fields, and JAXB can deal with private fields, so getters and setters are fully optional. Um, so, and therefore, I neither use uh, Lombok nor EDE plugins and try to write as lean code as only possible. And, um, the next thing is, what is interesting, the D-Lombok project, so what you could actually do, you could use you know, the Lombok and D-Lombok, which will regenerate, which will actually generate uh, the uh, real Java code, which could be an interesting um, procedure. So, um, yeah, so I think Project Lombok is a really interesting project, and I don't use it in production, or nor in my leisure, and no, yeah, and I, I tried it, looked nice, but... Um, I don't think I would be a significantly faster with Lombok than without. And if you really would like to have, you know, uh, you don't like Java because you have to write lots of getters and setters, first I will have to consider, uh, you know, re rethinking your design. And the next thing is, uh, probably you could use you know, another different uh, programming language on the JVM. So then you say, okay, um, because, yeah, I, it is not natural to Java, you know, to have something uh, which uh, works behind the scenes. And particularly, you know, in the at the beginning, there were some, I, I had some issues with Maven because it generated, you know, the sources. Now there's behind the scenes and um, yeah, but right now everything is fixed, but still. So so the answer is I don't use Lombok and the opinion is write lean code. And uh, and and then I think uh, you, you won't be significantly more productive with uh, Lombok. Or you shouldn't be. But uh, if you have crazy architects and they require you know to write all the all the plumbing, then Lombok could be you know the um, the prodigy of productivity. Okay. So uh, currently evaluating different container technologies. So we have Docker, and now we have Docker and Rocket and Run C. And the question is, uh, why you have chosen Docker instead of Rocket? So first. Uh, I have chosen Docker because there was no rocket in place. So I think I using Docker for several. Years. It was one zero six or zero five. It was the one. It, even the file system became corrupt. So I used already Docker back then. And rocket rocket came later. And uh, I think Docker is far more popular right now than Rocket. So and therefore I still use uh, Docker. But if Docker um, and and everyone knows Docker Rocket, uh, I have to explain that this is actually. Uh, something from CoreOS, 
and um, and 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 based on common standard. But yeah, this is Docker using production. All my clients are using Docker if they're using container virtualization, and I know that people are evaluating Rocket, and um, yeah, it will properly work as well. So for me, there is no need to evaluate right now because you know Docker ships out of the box with OpenShift. Um, all the Clouds are providing Docker, you know, ECS comes with Docker out of the box. So um, this is Amazon, uh, uh, this is Amazon uh, Elastic uh, containers. So um, yeah, but this is the reason. Okay, so let's see what happens here. Okay, no questions here. No questions sir, here. So I think we are done. So there was... Uh, this, this time it was the, a short one. <laughs> I bought microservice yesterday for my birthday. So thank you for, for to you. And um, so then hello to Brazil, Paris, USA, and uh, and Greece and see you on upcoming workshops, conferences, Java user groups. So I'm uh, this week and Java user group Darmstadt. And uh, just for you, keep it secret, end of year in Hamburg as well. But I was, um, I promised the organizer I won't tell anyone. It should be like a private meeting. So, but you know, you belong to Java family. So why not? And uh, yeah, and uh, yeah. I think this is the last of the year, right? So, yeah. So, uh, see you in 2017, in January of 2017. So, thank you for watching. See you at Earhex um, and bye.